for the inconvenience, and we'll jump back on here in just a second. Live and ready to go. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining uh, me here at One Minute Apologist. I'm Bobby Conway, and I'm excited to have Dr. Tim Stratton as my guest today to talk about mere Molinism. Uh, Tim is a personal friend, he's a gifted apologist, a Christian scholar, and he is the president and founder of Free Thinking Ministries. He uh, has his PhD in systematic theology, he got his master's in uh, philosophy from Biola University, and he currently resides in the great state of Nebraska. Let's bring in my brother, Dr. Tim Stratton. What's up, Tim? Hey, Bobby. How you doing, man? Doing great, bro. So stoked to have you on this week with me. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show because I got to tell you, I learned a lot from you back in the day. Before you knew who I was, I was following your stuff and learned oh, a man. lot from all of your videos that you made. So uh, thank you for uh, helping to point me in the right direction back in the early days. And, and that interview, the, the On Guard series you did with Dr. Craig, yeah. <laughs> I got so much out of that too. So, and I just had a blast with you last year in Israel. I think it was exactly a year ago right now is, that we were yes. uh, making that trip. And uh, oh, it was yeah. great to get to know you. Absolutely. Yeah. We had such a fun time being able to be there with a bunch of apologists yeah. on national Too platforms. Much. And here we were hanging out, eating good foods. And uh, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, thank you for those uh, compliments, uh, for sure, Tim. And I really appreciate your humility, your Christian character. And look, you're a guy that I just need to say straight up, if we're like in trouble and we're hanging out together, uh, I want Tim Stratton on my side. This dude <laughs> uh, used to be a professional uh, mixed martial artist, and uh, he could do some good uh, whip butt, some whip butt, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what's funny speaking about israel uh tim and i we we, we joke we were out at the dead sea and, you know and everybody's out there and you're doing this mudding and stuff and you're going through this therapeutic you know mudding that you're doing and stuff and, right and, you know but everyone's all out there getting pictures and i was tim's personal photographer he was able to pull off some <laughs> radical poses out there right there that's right bride tia right <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's right yeah so i told tim he, he reaches out so any kind of attire that i need to be aware of for coming on set today i said you know what bro we're just gonna go shirtless today that's the way we're that's gonna right. roll he replies <laughs> back and he goes well that'll go viral i respond right. to him, that'll be the last video people ever watch of us yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Tim, I've oh, loved yeah. seeing, uh, you know, I'm commenting on some of your 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 feed uh, with your new book, Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge and Mere Molinism. It's number one right now on Amazon. Check it out. Yeah, right. There it is. You have been uh, cracking me up in the way that you're promoting your book. Tell our audience a little bit about that. Well, uh, it started out, I asked my dad. He, My dad is great with Photoshop. And so I I said, hey, dad, can you can you make a picture of Dr. Strange from the Avengers reading my book? Because really, when you think about the, you know, Avengers uh, Endgame and uh, Infinity War, the, the way that Dr. Strange uses the time stone to uh, defeat the evil of Thanos, he's really using something quite similar to what we're going to talk about today, which is middle knowledge. And so uh, and what's interesting is the guy that uh, has developed Dr. Strange's character, Scott Derrickson, is a graduate from Biola University, and I think he majored in philosophy oh, right. and theology. So he's well aware of uh, middle knowledge, and you could see that he was using it. And uh, so anyway, I thought it'd be funny to have Dr. Strange reading my book, and we could say that Dr. <laughs> Strange used the time stone to go into the future to read my book since it wasn't yet published. But then he went back and used middle knowledge to defeat Thanos. Well, then everybody, uh, I mean, there's people around the world that are sending me uh, memes and images every day of different people reading my book. So I've got, uh, <laughs> well, uh, today the Mandalorian was sent to me. I, that'll be out tomorrow. Um, oh. And we've got Captain America reading it. And then we've got Martin Luther, uh, you know, that was nailing hilarious. this nailing this to the doors of Wittenberg and Calvin, uh, John Calvin reading the book. And so, yeah, it's just, uh, it's been fun. And I've got a good laugh out of seeing these pictures. 
Well, I think it's a, a genius way to promote a book. In fact, uh, next time I write a book, I'm going to be picking your head on how to promote it that way because I think it's the best promotion okay. oh, I've cool. ever seen somebody do for a book. So I really appreciate it and congratulate you for having the top spot in philosophy of religion right now with your book. Yeah. And I just wish you all the best, Tim, and what you do. Well, thank you very much, Bobby. So let's dive in. I mean, over the past 500 years, as it relates to uh, you know divine sovereignty and human responsibility, there has been uh, quite the controversy between Calvinists and Arminians. Yet there is this kind of third way uh, that has went under the radar, but has experienced a renaissance of interest in the time that we're living in. And this is the belief known as Molinism. And uh, you're here to talk to us today about mere Molinism. Isn't that correct? Yeah. That's right. Well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, okay, so, uh, you know. Or John McRae would say, what do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> He's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, so I guess if I was in an elevator, um, I, I'd, I'd break it down into two uh, simple ingredients. So, uh, yeah, mere Molinism entails two key essential ingredients. That's number one, logically prior to God's decision to create the world uh, our omniscient God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. Now, this entails something called God's middle knowledge, at least if God is powerful enough to create a free creature, and even if he never does create a free creature. So that's kind of a mouthful. Let me just make it simple, and, I, and I'll just say this. The first ingredient <laughs> is an omnipotent and omniscient God possesses middle knowledge. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. So if you believe that an omnipotent, that God is both omnipotent and omniscient, then I'm going to show you that he does possess middle knowledge. So that's the first thing. God possesses middle knowledge. The second ingredient is uh, that beings created in the image of God, humans mm -hmm. like God possess libertarian freedom. Now, uh, libertarian freedom uh, can be either the ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with one's nature at a given moment. And in my book, I demonstrate that God and man both possess this kind of freedom. Or it could just simply mean uh, a creature, uh, a, a human has libertarian freedom if they are not always causally determined by mm -hmm. something or someone else. And then I will argue in my book that God has this kind of freedom as well. So let me summarize that. The, the second key ingredient is that uh, I can just simply say that humans possess uh, libertarian free will, at least mm -hmm. occasionally. And then in my book, I'll support that philosophically and biblically. So it's vital to see here that, that mere Molinism is not necessarily a soteriological system uh, for people right. that don't know what that means. Uh, it's, uh, dealing with issues of salvation. So Molinism isn't necessarily uh, dealing with salvation issues. It's simply a model demonstrating how humans can at least sometimes be free and responsible, and also how God can be sovereign uh, over these free choices and our free thoughts and free actions of humanity. Now, typically, uh, I can get most Christians, if you give me a few minutes with them, I can get most Christians to affirm what I call mere Molinism. You know, if they take that elevator ride with me, or like when we were in Israel, you know how we were on that bus together, a big tour bus with all these philosophers and apologists, and we'd, you know, sit next to different people all the time. And, you know, uh, and I always said, you give me just a few minutes with you, I can probably get you to affirm mere Molinism. Um, so I can get most Christians to do that. But the big debate then is over if we should apply mere Molinism to salvation issues or not. And I am uh, I love to have that conversation too, but in my book, I really try to build a bridge between Calvinists and Arminians and show them that we can all be mere Molinists together. Uh, so <laughs> you can be a five-point Calvinist and still affirm mere Molinism. And you can be an Arminian and still affirm mere Molinism. Um, and then, you know, we then Arminians and Calvinists can debate if they should apply mere Molinism to salvation or not. I do, but hey, if you don't want to, 
I'm cool with that. Uh, so anyway, one can move beyond mere Molinism and apply these two essentials to salvation issues or, or soteriological issues. But I say that's not necessary. Um, but if you do that, then uh, I call myself a soteriological Molinist because I affirm one more ingredient. So uh, you've got God has middle knowledge, humans have libertarian freedom. And then, then if you affirm number three, that God is a maximally great being who loves and desires the best for all people, then, or, or, or simply God is omnibenevolent, then I say, if you affirm all three of those, then you are not just a mere Molinist, you're a, a soteriological Molinist. But uh, I'll just say that a soteriological view of Molinism entails each of those three ingredients, but competing views will deny at least one of those three vital points. For example, uh, there's open theists out there uh, and simple foreknowledge folks who deny that God possesses middle knowledge of possible worlds within his power to create. And mm -hmm. then Calvinists and other uh, divine determinists, you know, what I call exhaustive divine determinists, regu regularly uh, reject the notion of human libertarian freedom, and they often dismiss the omnibenevolence of God. And I, I drop, you know, I name names in my book. And I, I show how some Calvinists, at least inadvert inadvertently, if not explicitly, reject at least one of the omni attributes of God, either God's omnipotence, omniscience, or omnibenevolence. And they reject the, the maximal greatness then of God, even if they don't intend to do so. Most of them don't try to do it, but I show that they are doing it uh, with what they're saying. And I, and I say, look, we cannot do such a thing. We cannot uh, diminish the glory of God. <laughs> um, and if you're, you know, I, I say, in fact, if one's interpretation of scripture leads him to conclude that God is not maximally great, um, that he's not either omnipotent, omniscient, or omnibenevolent, then we can know that he has misinterpreted scripture. And I, I like to say it this way, you know, I have a very high view of scripture, but I have an even higher view of God because I have a maximally great view of God. So with all that said in the last chapter, I show how mere Molinism and sometimes even how soteriological Molinism is significant for Christians who take apologetics seriously. And, you know, those who read my book will see that at least one of the two essential ingredients of mere Molinism, and, and sometimes that third ingredient also, is connected with multiple apologetics-based arguments, you know, what Dr. Craig refers to as the cumulative case. And so with that in mind, it seems that Molinism has logically consistent access to so many more arguments for the existence of God, you know, not to mention offering powerful defenses to objections raised against the existence of God, you know, like the problem of moral evil, the problem of natural evil, the problem of gratuitous evil, and I know even the problem of divine hiddenness. Um, Molinism has access to defeating those objections raised against the knowledge of God. Uh, and does a better job of handling these things more than any other view of God's sovereignty. In fact, uh, I don't think these other views um, can do it. So while while this does not deductively prove that Molinism is true, I do have argue, other arguments that deductively prove that much. Um, but just being uh, Molinism, making sense of all the, you know, the cumulative case of apologetics arguments, that doesn't prove that Molinism is true, but it does kind of show that it it should probably be a preferable view. So I don't know. I yeah. kind of went off there. Does that make sense? No, that's great. And I appreciate you setting the table for this feast that we're going to share together. I do want to uh, say, Tim, on the other side, um, that now I'm experiencing the tech challenge because ever since we started the conversation, you're frozen on a screen. So oh, no. uh, if there's anything in my eyes that look like they're not as connected to you, it's because I can't read your movements. I can't read your eyes. I can't even see what's happening right now. I'm just listening. So it's huh. unfortunate. Uh, yeah. So uh, for those who are watching this right now, just know that I, I can't see Tim. I'm just in an audible state and uh, we'll go with it. Uh, but I did want you to be aware of that. Um, how are you doing on the other side? Can you see me talking? Yeah, I can see you and I can see me and you're moving. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Well, that, that's all that matters. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to listen my way through this conversation. 
Um, you know, you mentioned Dr. William Lane Craig a moment ago, and we're talking about your book again, as we're setting the table for Molinism. And here you kind of talked about the two conditions that you can be a Calvinist and Arminian and kind of say, Hey, I'm a mere Molinist, but then you kind of brought in the third condition of God being maximally great. And I really love the way that you expounded that and, uh, really helping us to understand, uh, what that entails. We're going to unpack that, but before we do, uh, I wanted to read, uh, a statement, uh, an endorsement from William Lane Craig, somebody that we both look up to. He said this about your book, Tim, for years, I've hoped to see someone take my work, expand upon it, make it their own and run with it. This is exactly what Dr. Stratton has done in human freedom, divine knowledge, and mere Molinism. Stratton makes a systematic case for mere Molinism by examining scripture and history while appealing to metaphysics and perfect being theology. The final chapter connecting Molinism to the cumulative case of, of apologetic arguments and addressing the problem of evil is worth the price of admission alone. Isn't that yeah. Really encouraging, Tim. Oh man, that uh, you know that blew my mind uh, when Dr. Craig first told that to me. And uh, you just got to say that Dr. Craig is my hero. And <laughs> for him to for him to give my book that kind of endorsement made this entire project that took uh, several years uh, made it all worthwhile. So thank you, Dr. Craig. <laughs> For your yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Boy, it's just amazing um, what his scholarship has brought about, you know, um, just the things that he has kind of helped with the Kalam cosmological argument and Molinism and abstract objects and just right. the kind of things that have just gotten great traction. Uh, it's incredible. Right. Uh, Tim, why can't these other views of God's sovereignty uh, work? And I guess what is the problem that you're trying to solve in your book? Yeah. Okay. Well, the other, the other views of God's sovereignty. Let's let's start with Calvinism. Um, I used oh, to. Oh, by be, the way. Yeah. Yes. Were you going to say you used to be a Calvinist? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then let's talk about that just for a moment as you enter, because I used to be a five point Calvinist too. Tim. Yeah. Right. 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 We had some good talks about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I used to be what I called a hardcore cage stage Calvinist uh, for for many years. In fact. Um, I didn't just merely affirm all five points of TULIP, right? The famous five points of Calvinism. I went even further and affirmed ED or EDD, uh, which is not necessary, but quite common for Calvinists to do. So let me describe ED. Uh, Calvinism is often reduced to what I describe as exhaustive divine determinism. So that's your ED, your EDD, exhaustive divine determinism. And that's a view that God exhaustively causes and determines in one way or another all things, everything uh, that happens, every event. Mm -hmm. And now here's the deal. If all things really means all things, then this would include all the thoughts, actions, beliefs, and behaviors of all people all the time. So, so every single thought in your head, every word in your head, and every action that follows is ultimately caused and determined by God on this view. So yeah, that was the, that was the view that I affirmed. In fact, I, I called myself a cage stage Calvinist, and that means I was ready to fight on this issue with anybody, anywhere. Like um, most Calvinists, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. They call it cage stage because it's better to be in a cage than to be let loose out in public. Um, when you're, when you're that excited about Calvinism. Um, but, uh, um, so I, I used to be, uh, this, this hardcore Calvinist. And, um, as you can imagine though, this rightly leads many to conclude that if God is causing and determining all your thoughts and beliefs and actions and behaviors all the time, well, this leads many to conclude that if, uh, if the view of Calvinism is true, then God is ultimately the author of evil. And the one who forces the majority of humanity to suffer into the eternal fires of hell, you know, for all eternity and into the infinite future. And I do think this is a logical outworking of the view. And mm -hmm. I explain, I explain this in my book. So this doesn't, you know, I, it doesn't seem like when you think about that, if God is causing and determining the Holocaust or causing and, and determining uh, Ted Bundy or, you know, fill in the blank with any evil, um, and let alone causing and determining uh, the vast majority of humans to suffer into the infinite future of hell. 
you know, that that doesn't really seem like the omnibenevolent God who is love, according to First John four eight, um, uh, that that Jesus claimed to represent, or the the God who desires all people to be saved in First Timothy two four, and the God who desires no one to perish in Second Peter three nine, or the God who so loved the world that whosoever, right, in John three sixteen. So this leads many to choose the second option, that simple foreknowledge view that's commonly mm -hmm. referred to as Arminianism. I don't think mm -hmm. uh, necessarily needs to be Arminianism, but I would say that often those who call themselves Arminians are holding the simple foreknowledge view. Now, this view gives humans the freedom to choose to sin or not to sin, and also uh, humans the ability to choose our individual eternal destinies. So, so this view gets God off the hook, as it were, uh, for the evil deeds humans freely choose to commit. Now, that's the good news that this view offers. But the bad news is that this simple foreknowledge view also seems to relieve God of his providence and sovereignty. I mean, after mm -hmm. all, think about it. If God simply and merely foreknows the future free actions of creatures, well, how is he in any legitimate control over the future free actions of creatures. Just because you know what, how a person will freely choose in the future, that, that doesn't give you any kind of control or predestination that the Bible talks about or sovereignty over it. So, so yeah, I mean, the Bible is clear that God predestines things. Uh, not only is God sovereign, but he predestines not only the elect to heaven, so we could see in Galatians 1.15, but that God is provident over all things. You know, uh, Romans 8.28, Ephesians 1.11, those are uh, good places to start. But here's the deal. If God predestines all things to happen, then how could this simple foreknowledge view of Arminianism uh, be true? Now, mm -hmm. I think Arminianism is close, but right, uh, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades or something like that. So, um, <laughs> in fact, in my book, I show that some scholars actually think Arminius, that Jacobus Arminius, was a closet Molinist. Um, some scholars disagree with that, but there's mm -hmm. debate there. Uh, but what's not uh, under dispute is that his followers, known as the Arminians, uh, they did not understand middle knowledge. Some people think Arminius did. He wrote about it. Molina's writings were in his library. Mm -hmm. um, he was quoted by uh, by Arminius. So uh, Arminius himself might have been a Molinist, maybe, maybe not. But the Arminians clearly didn't understand middle knowledge, and thus the Synod of Dort uh, was dealing with the Arminians and uh I would say then, and I explained this in my book, I think the Synod of, of Dort uh, really attacked a straw man and not the real thing. Um, but I, I spend multiple chapters on uh, history of thought uh, from Augustine to Aquinas to Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon and uh, to Arminius and obviously Molina and the uh, Synod of Dort and even all the way to Jonathan Edwards. Um, so we, I mean, I just encourage people to read my book. If you're a history buff, you're going to like that part of it. So, yeah, even if uh, John Calvin had the opportunity to hang a little bit uh, with Molina, uh, you kind of feel like he could have uh, cleaned up some of his thoughts. Uh, I've heard yes. you say before. Right. That's exactly right. And in fact, I use Calvin, Calvin's own words. I use Luther's own words. I use uh, Philip Melanchthon's own words to support uh, mere Molinism. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think uh, if they could have all been in the same room together back in the day um, and hashed this out, I think they would have at least all become mere Molinists. Uh, the only one who wouldn't um, was post-Reformation on my view, and that would be Jonathan Edwards. Okay. So I think oftentimes today, mm -hmm. Calvinists are uh, more enamored with the views of Edwards than they are with Calvin or anybody else in the Reformation. Um so I, I think uh, it seems to me that Edwards was a pretty staunch uh, Ed guy, an exhaustive divine determinist. But I, mm -hmm. I show why his view, um, why Edwardsian compatibilism even, it just it does not work. And I make a couple different arguments in my book against Edwards' view. But I think uh, Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon and the, uh, and the Reformers um, 
Yeah, I really do. I, I'm, I try to make a case that they would be mere Molinists. You know, Tim, uh, it, as one who is on the side of like really wanting to emphasize the sovereignty of God uh, as a five point Calvinist in my past, um, yeah. you know, I've told you that the way I walked out of it is um, I, I started getting uncomfortable uh, with uh, some of the logical um, conclusions that I was thinking about as it related to God. And David Baggett in his book, Good God, uh, really helped with Jerry Walls to mm -hmm. help me to cement uh, that I, I was walking away from Calvinism uh, with this whole concept, if A, then B. If A implies I ought to believe, then mm -hmm. B implies that I can. But if A implies I ought to believe and B implies I can't uh, believe, then how in the world am I really morally culpable if, if I can't respond? And so uh, I know as a Calvinist, I would go out and I'd preach the gospel and I'd say, you know, hey, whosoever will can believe, you know, and it, but it wasn't like they really genuinely could. And I feel All like right. looking back at my season of being a Calvinist, number one, I would use straw mans on the Arminian. So it'd be like, for example, uh, if you if you say you place your faith in Christ, then you're contributing to your salvation. Well, that's right. stupid. Like, no, mm -hmm. Armenians don't really think that. That's a straw man argument that we would say as Calvinists to make us feel good in our Calvinism. But no Armenian really thinks they're contributing to their salvation. Then the other thing is it related to uh, the if A, if A implies I ought to believe, B implies I can believe. That made that that resonated. But if I can't believe, then I thought, wow, Christianity is starting to sound like Allahism. Uh, fatalism, like, like, like I realized that I wanted to emphasize, and I think many Calvinists do, they want to, they, which is great. We want to talk about how sovereign God is, but I think that we've overdefined the word into fatalism and we have to redefine what we mean by sovereignty. And so we got to get down to some definitions and I know you'll help us do that today, but I just wondered if you had some of the same experience of fatalism and feeling some of that in your experience. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, there was times in my cage stage Calvinist uh, stage of life where I would find myself praying for my friends who weren't saved. And uh, I remember praying for one, you know, this one guy that I used to train when I was a MMA coach and I was praying for him one night. My son was just a little guy still. He's probably only four, five years old. He's a senior now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so this was back in the day, and I was praying. I was in the other room in my office praying, and you know, my son was uh, playing video games. I remember, and anyway, I'm praying, and I was like, well, "Why am I wasting time praying for this guy? God knows if he's elect or not. Uh, God, you know, God will either elect him or he won't. He's been elect before the foundations of the world, or he hasn't been. You know, as Calvin said, uh, those who are damned are doomed from the womb. So." You know, I started thinking about those things. I'm like, ah, I don't need to pray. I'll, I'll just go play video games with my son. And I did. So, I mean, when I started thinking about the logical outworkings of the view, even with prayer, um, it actually hindered my prayers. Um, and uh, especially when I started thinking about exhaustive divine determinism, when I stopped mm -hmm. praying, I just figured and realized, I should say, oh, well, God stopped me to cut, uh, stop me to from praying. God made me play video games with my son. Um, <laughs> look what God made me do. Um, you know, <laughs> look what you made me do. Um, uh, you know, so anyway, because of this, I actually, in the last chapter, at the end of the last chapter in my book, I discuss how prayer works and how Molinism shows that prayer actually makes a difference mm -hmm. and how God can still be sovereign over your prayers, even though you're free and responsible for your prayers. So I try to, in the, in the last chapter, I try to take all this academic systematic theology and philosophy and bring it down uh, to the streets, if you will, um, showing how it, it doesn't just help with apologetics, but how it helps with pastoral issues and just everyday Christian life when it comes to sharing the gospel or praying or, uh, you know, and other things like that. So. Well, Tim, so far then in the discussion, you seem to have presented us with a dilemma. Uh, and, uh, you know, you once a Calvinist, I once was a Calvinist. We talked about kind of like our exodus. Uh, you're sharing with how with me right now and our audience how 
uh, Molinism uh, became appealing to you. Uh, it, but it looks like we've got a false dilemma on our hands uh, if we just consider the first two options that you laid out in your introduction. Uh, how do we split this, uh, the horns of this moral dilemma that we might find ourselves in? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, you know, I was raised uh, with those two options. You're either a Calvinist or you're an Arminian. And the way I was raised uh, in, in my church, uh, my pastor at the time was the hardcore Calvinist. What's interesting, uh, he, after I started my journey and left Calvinism, the, the guy that made me a hardcore Calvinist started uh, talking to me and we debated about it for years. And what guess what happened? Now he's a Molinist and he actually uh, <laughs> he works part time for, for free thinking ministries now. Um, That's cool, bro. great guy. But, uh, you know, I, I, so I would say, yeah, we've been the, the church is typically uh, has been offered this false dilemma between Calvinism and Arminianism. But there is a view in the middle that splits the horns of the false dilemma. Um, so, you know, I like to say it's appropriate that a Spaniard is the one who split the horns of this beast. Um, and that is to say uh, the false dilemma has been defeated by a 16th century theologian from Spain named Luis de Molina. So uh, Molina, uh, Molinism, we get the word Molinism from his last name. So Molina offered the model of Molinism, but in my book, uh, I, I argue for more than just uh, that there's a model. I argue that the model has got to be true through several uh, logically deductive syllogisms that, uh, that end, you know, I have several that end with, therefore, humans possess libertarian freedom, others that end, therefore, God possesses middle knowledge, uh, and then I have other ones that end with, therefore, mere Molinism is true. And so these are logically valid, uh, you know, it's structurally valid. Uh, and sound, logically deductive syllogisms, uh, you know, the same kind of stuff that Dr. Craig likes to offer with the Kalam and the moral argument and everything else. And I just applied all of that to, to this topic. So I had a lot of fun crafting these arguments. I've been, uh, enjoyed even today in just uh, taking advantage of some time to be floating around on uh, your website and, and reading. Um, I do appreciate your logical thinking, Tim. Uh, it's orderly, it's precise, it's helpful, and I think it's making a difference right now. And I do want to encourage people to go to Amazon and check out a copy of your book. Uh, we're talking about Molinism with the president and founder of Free Thinking Ministries, not Molitism like Billy Ray Cyrus and his <laughs> mullet, uh, but we are definitely talking about Molinism. Uh, tell us about Luis de Molina and his views, Tim. <laughs> yeah, you bet. So, uh, so Molinism uh, grounds God's sovereignty not only in his omnipotence as divine determinist solely focus, typically, but it also considers God's omniscience. So it's really a view that's dedicated to the maximal greatness of God. And so in my book, uh, I have several sections just where I talk about God's omnipotence, then God's omniscience, and then God's omnibenevolence. And I call these the big three of God's omni attributes. Now, <clears throat> namely, uh, what Molina did was he pointed out, uh, as I alluded to earlier, that since God is all powerful, that he's omnipotent. Um, you know, think of that omnipotent. That means omnipotential. God can do a whole bunch of things. God can do everything that's logically possible, right? So that means there's a whole bunch of things God can do even if God never does them, because, you know, it stands to reason that God has not done everything he has the power to do. But if God is all powerful, then that means he can do a whole bunch of things that he's never done and probably that he never will do. So uh, that means that God has the ability to create many different possible worlds, including worlds with creatures whom he does not always causally determine. So that is to say that God, being omnipotent, has the power to create beings who possess libertarian free will, even if he never does so. So, so even if, let's just say everything is causally determined. Let's say that EDD is true, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think it is, but for the sake of argument, if I were to say, okay, Ed is true, God, exhaustive divine determinism is true, an omnipotent God could have created free creatures, right? Even if somebody doesn't think he did, God could have. He's power. He's that powerful. He's omnipotent. So unless somebody can show that there's a logical contradiction there, like saying that God could create a married bachelor or 
that Jesus could, you know, draw a triangle with four corners in the dirt, you know, whatever. If somebody could show that there's <laughs> some logical contradiction there, yeah. uh, unless they can do that, then then it stands to reason that God has the power to create uh, creatures with libertarian freedom. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Since we're keeping God's maximal greatness in mind, if if God was powerful enough to create different worlds and free creatures, even if he never does, and since he's also all-knowing, he's omniscient, all right, so we're starting the God's omnipotent, and now we're saying since he's also omniscient, God would perfectly know all that would happen in each of these potential worlds that are within God's power to create, and you know, if God chose to create them and even if he never chose to create them. So right. if God knows this, uh, even if he never chose to create free creatures, then he's got middle knowledge. So right. it's vital to understand because that means that he has this knowledge logically prior to his creative decree. So mm -hmm. that's vital to understand. An omniscient God knows what would be the case if he used his omnipotent power and actualize these possibilities. An omnipotent God would uh, would possess even if he never brought these possible worlds into existence. Um, I'll say it this way. God still knows what would have happened if he created any of these worlds within his power to bring into actual existence. So that might get a little confusing uh, for some that have never studied this before. Um, and we're starting to go into some maybe some deeper philosophical and theological waters here. So let me make it really simple and just just restate it like this. God knows all that would happen in any possible world he could create. Right, As I'm going to boil it down to that. Yeah. God knows all that would happen in any possible world He could create. So, so focus on the difference between would and could. Mm -hmm. God knows all that would happen in any possible world He could create. So, this on, on this full view of God's omniscience, it it must include what is referred to as middle knowledge. So, the question is raised: What is this kind of knowledge in the middle of? So, we've got different moments of divine knowledge that theologians and philosophers like to talk about. So the first one is called natural knowledge, then we've got middle knowledge, and then we've got free knowledge. So natural knowledge uh, just basically boils down to everything that God could do. God knows everything that he could do. Now, since he's omnipotent, that's a whole bunch of stuff, right? And that includes all the things that he's never done. And, and then explain possible worlds just for people that might be listening and they're thinking, yeah, okay, you're talking about a world of possibilities, but I mean, we're talking in counterfactual terms here too. So if you yeah. can just give our audience a sense of how that's being used. So we're talking about everything that God could do. So anything he could do, uh, even though he never did it, that's called a possible world. If that helps. Now, if you yeah. watch the Avengers, I, I noted earlier that Dr. Strange, uh, use something similar to middle knowledge, uh, to defeat Thanos, right? So maybe watching those movies will help. It's not a perfect analogy, but it might help you to start to connect some dots. And so Dr. True, yeah. Strange, if you remember, he uses a time stone to look into like 16 million different possible futures. They use the term uh, possible futures instead of possible worlds. So the 16 million or so different ways uh, the future could be, but, you know, and then they said, well, how many worlds do we defeat? Thanos. And he's like, only one of those worlds. <laughs> so, um, so that would then be the best possible world, even if it uh, included a bunch of bad stuff in it too. Um, but, or, or the best feasible world. Anyway, I don't want to get distracted. Um, so anyway, something that God could have done. So think about it this way. Uh, God did not have to create at all. He could have just remained in what I call a static state of aseity. Um, mm -hmm. Just he was perfectly. For those. Pardon me. I was just saying that's self-existence for those who might not be aware of a seity. Right. He could just. He was totally perfectly content as a trinity. Didn't need to create. Well, if he didn't need to create, then he doesn't have to create, and therefore, you and I exist uh, contingently, and through the grace of God, we exist. We do not have to exist. So, a possible way things could have been is that God never creates. Well, that's a possible world. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we've got the actual world that we live in. Well, that's also a possible world, but it's also an actual world. realized. It's realized, yeah. And but God could have created differently. He could have created a, a universe where humans don't exist. He could have created a universe where Wookies 
exist. Um, God, that's within God's power. He could have done that, right? We don't think yeah. that Wookiees actually exist. That, that would be <laughs> awesome, right? <laughs> would be uh, cute but, little dudes. <laughs> um, but those are possible worlds. God could have created a world in which you and I aren't having this conversation right now. So you mm -hmm. and I are not having this conversation necessarily, right? Um, we it, Things could have been different. God could have created a world uh, where I'm wearing a, a red shirt um, or a world in which I have hair or a world in which unicorns exist or a, uni a world, a world, in, which, a, a world <laughs> in which my biceps are bigger than yours. You know, he could have done that. You know? <laughs> So they are bigger, anyway, those are possible. <laughs> yeah. So, so then, so, so that's everything that God could do, even if mm -hmm. he never does them. So then you've got middle knowledge that Molina discovered, if you will. And, and that refers to everything that God knows would happen based on everything he could do. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how I like to explain it. Basically yeah, helps, middle knowledge is referring to what, philosophers call counterfactuals of freedom. But I like to summarize that as what would happen if. So God yeah. in his natural knowledge knows everything that he could do. And God in his middle knowledge knows everything that would happen if he did any of those things that he could do and even the things that he could do, but he never does. All right. God knows all that. And then we have what's called God's creative decree. God makes a decision. After that, after God decides what he's going to do, that he's going to create, make one of these possible worlds an actual world, boom, now you've got free knowledge. And that means that God knows all that will happen in the actual world. So middle knowledge is, the reason why it's called middle is simply because it's in between <laughs> God's natural knowledge and his free knowledge. It's not, you know, some deeper meaning than that. <laughs> so uh, it's in between. And so basically what I show is, you know, if God is omnipotent and omniscient, then he's got to have this uh, natural and middle knowledge. And then once he makes his decision, he's got uh, the uh, free knowledge, which, which means that he knows everything that will happen. Now, maybe before today, uh, many of your viewers have never heard of any of these terms before. Um, but, uh, again, I'll just make it clear. Natural knowledge refers to everything that God knows he could actualize. Um, you know, all potential situations within God's power to make actual middle knowledge refers to the fact that God knows everything that would happen if he were to create a certain world within his power to actualize. And even if he never does, and God's free knowledge means that God knows all that will happen in the world that he's chosen to create. And we call that the actual world. So in a nutshell, if God is always omniscient, then God perfectly knows all that could happen and all that will happen. And he knows all that would have happened in different situations that he could have created. So that is to say God knows all that could, would, and will happen. And middle knowledge brings the would. So uh, <laughs> I just told theologians, you cannot dismiss uh, this would knowledge, this middle knowledge. And that, that seems simple enough. But the part that often confuses at least the lay person is that it's vital to note that God's knowledge of what could and would happen is what we, you know, here's some philosophy and theology here. It's logically prior. God's natural knowledge and middle knowledge is logically before God's decision to create the universe and God's knowledge of what will happen. His foreknowledge in the universe is logically after not chronologically after his creative decree. So that's about as deep into the philosophical waters as I'm going to try to bring your audience today. Um, but I try to really unpack this and explain it more in my book. So if this interests yeah. you, or if you're even confused, make sure you go to my book and I'll try to explain it uh, <laughs> with more clarification, I guess. And be sure to check out uh, freethinkingministries.com where there's lots of articles where Tim and his team have put that together as well. Okay, so, so Tim... YouTube. Our YouTube uh, channel too. Just go to YouTube, search for Free Thinking Ministries, and we've got many videos there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you released that YouTube just a few months ago, didn't you? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, Tim, now this kind of you know begs the question for us to consider: uh, 
you know, if God's sovereign over all things, how can humans, uh, you know, be free and, you know, ultimately responsible for some things if God's still just completely, you know, in charge and sovereign? How do we bring in human uh, freedom? Well, that's a great question. That's a million dollar question and uh, something I really try to focus on. But so before we do that, let's define some terms. So first, uh, so the sovereignty of God. That's the, the doctrine that, uh, that God is the supreme authority and all things somehow are under his control. Now, the majority of Christians uh, believe that God is somehow sovereign over all things. But the crazy point of contention, and I've described this as cultish or cult-like for, for some involved in these conversations, is regarding the, the debate over exactly how God is sovereign over all things. Mm -hmm. It really drives me crazy when I see Christians <laughs> that are so committed to how God is, uh, how God predestines or how God is sovereign when they're, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, anyway, I, I actually do like how the Westminster confession of faith describes the sovereignty of God. Um, here, I got this here. Let me read it. It says God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own free will or of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatever comes to pass. I agree. And in my book, I explain how God can do this without violating human libertarian freedom. So with that said, the next step, um, once we've got sovereignty out of the way, now we need to define libertarian freedom or libertarian free will. Uh, sometimes it's just referred to as libertarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, but libertarianism or libertarian freedom is often expressed uh, like this, that they'll say, number one, uh, free will is incompatible with determinism, and number two, some of our actions are free. Now, some maintain that an agent is free in a libertarian sense only if they possess the freedom to think or act otherwise. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me, however, that if an agent is ever uncaused or not causally determined in thought or action and is simply the source of his or her thought or action. And, e you know, so even if the agent cannot think or act otherwise for some weird reason, I don't know why, but if they're merely the source, then they're still free in a libertarian sense. If they're not causally determined by something or someone else. So, so I like to say it like this, we can, we can distinguish between the principle of alternative possibilities, uh, that's called the PAP or the PAP, the principle of alternative possibilities, uh, that's commonly referred to as the ability to do otherwise version of libertarian freedom. But then we've got the other version of libertarian freedom that is simply called the sourcehood version or the source version. Now, and that one just simply means you're not causally determined by something or someone else. Now, look, I think both of these views are true. Sometimes both are true simultaneously, and sometimes I'll show that, well, even if someone uh, might not have an ability to do otherwise here, they're still free in a libertarian sourcehood sense. And then I show how this is true for God, too. I think sometimes God is free in the sourcehood sense. In fact, he always is. And sometimes God has the ability to do otherwise because he's omnipotent. Um, so, uh, and then I show how humans created in God's image can have both of these simultaneously. So I guess the, the, the sourcehood version of libertarian freedom, uh, well, let me say the, the, the PAP, the principle of alternative possibilities or the ability to do otherwise is sufficient for libertarian freedom. Um, but I don't claim that it's always necessary, but the sourcehood version mm -hmm. of libertarian freedom is always necessary, if that makes sense. So I'll say it like this, if I can prove, uh, and I, I make these arguments in my book, if I can prove that a person possesses the ability to do otherwise, then I have demonstrated that this person possesses libertarian freedom. However, right. suppose I can't prove that much, uh, but I can, however, uh, you know, show that a person is not causally determined at some point by something or someone else. Well, if I can do merely that much, even if I can't show the ability to, to do otherwise, then I've still demonstrated that this person possesses libertarian freedom. Now, with all that said, uh, I typically and not always like to defend a specific definition of libertarian freedom that I think entails both versions. So when I can, mm -hmm. I defend this version. 
And I'll say that libertarian freedom is simply the ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with one's nature at a given moment. So look, I'm I'm using the word compatible there. Uh, The ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with one's nature at a given moment. Now, I won't get into all this probably today, but I really spend a lot of time uh, taking down a view called compatibilism or uh, compatibilistic freedom, which is uh, not libertarian freedom. It's opposed to libertarian freedom. Um, well, uh, it's it's I guess it's a thesis that merely says that free will and or responsibility is compatible with determinism. And in my book, I showed that this thesis mm-hmm. does not describe reality all the time. It might describe reality on occasion, but I demonstrate how it cannot, this thesis cannot describe the way things are, cannot describe reality exhaustively or all the time. So, uh, but I do say here that the word compatible is in this definition of libertarian freedom. So libertarian freedom is not the ability to do things that are not compatible with your nature. It's simply that sometimes there are multiple things compatible with our image of God nature at a given moment. And I discuss this in more detail in the book. Okay. So Tim, at this stage, uh, you know, we're, we kind of kicked it off and we talked about how for the last 500 years, you know, since the time of the reformation, the church in general has kind of uh, lived within two options. You've got your Calvinists, you got your Arminians, and they've often just demonized one another. Uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, something that's kind of, uh, really experiencing a renaissance through, um, you know, the writings of Dr. William Lane Craig, uh, you and others is Molinism, the search and how you split the horns of the dilemma. Uh, we needed to define some terms and you've been unpacking for us some of these important definitions. But I think it's important uh, now that you've kind of taken the time to define yourself that we kind of get back to the question that I posed to you a little bit ago. And that is this, if God is sovereign over uh, all things, how is it then that humans are indeed, uh, you know, culpable and responsible for some things in their existence yeah. here on earth? Yeah, that's a great question. I think Molinists have an awesome answer. You know, if, uh, if God has the power and ability to create free creatures and, and he perfectly knows how free creatures would freely think, act, believe, and behave, if he were to create them, then if God chooses to create them, knowing how they would freely think, act, believe, and behave, then God can actualize a world, create a world where these creatures will freely Mm. think, act, believe, and behave exactly as they know that as God knew they would. Let me, let Mm. me say that again. If God chooses to create creatures, knowing how they would freely choose, then God can actualize a world where these creatures will freely choose exactly as God knew they would if he were to create them. So mm-hmm. think about it this way. I, um, let me use some philosophical language, I guess. I try to avoid this as much as I can, but... Um, yeah, we can tell, Tim. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, okay. Um, <laughs> You're doing great, though, right. bro. What's that? He said, you're doing great. Oh, thank you. All right. I'll say it like this. Um, I wrote an article recently on my website called The Freedom to Trick God. So if anybody wants to look at this, but in there, I I say that Molinism would entail the following on a categorical ability, a, a real ability to do otherwise in the actual world. So we'll say that God knows um, that Sally would. So this, again, this is logically prior to God's decision to create anything. So God knows that Sally would freely choose X instead of not X if he were to create her in non-causal deterministic circumstance C. All right. So, Mm -hmm. uh, So God knows how Sally would freely choose if he creates her in a circumstance where She's got freedom uh, where she's not causally determined. Then God creates Sally in non-causal deterministic circumstance C. God creates Sally uh, in a world in which she's not causally determined. So if that's the case, if God knew how Sally would freely choose 
that Sally would freely choose X instead of not X if he were to create her in this non-causal deterministic circumstance. And then God chooses to create her in this non-causal deterministic circumstance. Now, God knows Sally will freely choose X instead of not X in this non-causal deterministic circumstance. So here's the takeaway. That might have been confusing, but here's the deal. Just because the word would transforms mm-hmm. to will, the word freely does not magically disappear. So right. again, God knows how Sally would freely choose if he were to create her. God chooses to create her. Now God knows how Sally will freely choose. The word freely is there. All that changes is the word would to will, but freely does not magically disappear. So a lot of people think that we somehow lose our freedom once God creates us with freedom. And that doesn't make sense, right? Right. Um, But we have to realize that all that happens is the word would. God knows what we would do if he were to create us. God creates us, and now God knows how we will freely choose. God knows how we would freely choose if he were to create us. He creates us now. Knows how we will freely choose. So if this is the case, then God is not causally determining free creatures because they are free with no causal strings attached or no causal chains attached. You know, So creatures are not caused and determined by God or anything else. They are libertarianly free, at least in the source sense, and seem to have a genuine ability to do otherwise. So mm-hmm. uh, at least on occasion. So this Middle knowledge view of Molinism splits the horns of this false dilemma by offering a great middle position between Calvinism and Arminianism. And again, it's not necessarily even a soteriological system. So both of these camps have access to uh, mere Molinism. And uh, so, you know, well, I'll just say that, you know, like Calvinism, Molinism affirms the biblical truth that God predestines all that will happen, right? The Calvinists and Molinists agree on that. Uh, Molinist, uh, the Molinism uh, is clear that, that God predestines all that will happen, including all that will freely happen in a libertarian sense. And there is nothing outside of God's sovereignty in all of his creation. Molino is clear about that. Now, the, the Calvinist is going to say amen to that. But like the Arminian, Molinism also affirms and logically explains how that humans possess a genuine libertarian freedom and that humans are genuinely responsible for at least, you know, that we're, we're, we're responsible for our rational thoughts and moral actions. Um, mm. And although Calvinism and Arminianism uh, both make sense, in, in my book I say, well, they both make sense of, of much of the data, of the biblical data, but neither of them seem to be able to explain all the data, but it seems to me that after considering God's middle knowledge, Molinism seems to be able to explain the biblical data from cover to cover. So I think it's a a preferable view. I think it's the inference to the best explanation of all the biblical data, historical data, uh, philosophical and metaphysical data, and the uh, theological data. So I just think it's a, I think it's true. It makes the most sense of everything. So, Tim, I mean, you have mentioned so far, you know, that mere Molinism requires God to possess uh, middle knowledge and that humans possess libertarian freedom. Uh, Having said that, uh, we know that the church has been divided uh, over this idea of human freedom for centuries. Uh, Here you're presenting, you know, middle knowledge and you believe that that can kind of help bring some closure to this longstanding debate that we have experienced. Uh, In your book, you provide, uh, you know, different arguments to help drive home your point, deductive arguments. I would ask um, maybe you to share an argument. I know that for the sake of time, we've been on for a while and we want to start trying to, um, you know, drive home some of these concluding points, but I do want people to see an argument for how this works. So uh, can you take one of these uh, deductive arguments that you've developed and let us see how this pans out? Sure. Uh, I offer multiple arguments in my book, Um, some that's based on biblical data, others uh, that's just based on, you know, uh, metaphysics. Um, Let me give you one that's pretty popular. It's called the free thinking argument against naturalism, and it's eight steps. So hang with me. It's four premises (laughs) premises <laughs> and three deductive conclusions and one abductive conclusion. So I'll fly through it here. Premise one, 
If naturalism is true, the immaterial human soul does not exist. Two, if the soul does not exist, libertarian freedom does not exist. Three, if libertarian freedom does not exist, then it's impossible to rationally infer and rationally affirm knowledge claims. Four, it is possible to rationally infer and rationally affirm knowledge claims. Five, therefore, libertarian freedom exists. Six, therefore, the soul exists. Seven, therefore, naturalism is false. And eight, the best explanation of the existence of libertarian freedom and the soul is the biblical view of God. Now, uh, steps five, six, and seven are all deductive. So, you know, I like to uh, really focus on those, but I'll defend the premises here very quickly. Again, this is if I was in an elevator, I, I think I could uh, defend these quickly. A uh, premise one is synonymous with if naturalism is true, nature is all that exists. That's straightforward and true by definition. Premise two is tantamount to if all that exists is nature, then all that exists, including everything about humanity, is causally determined via the laws of nature, the initial conditions of the Big Bang, quantum mechanics, things outside of human control. Well, premise three communicates the fact that if something outside of human control causally determines you to affirm a false belief, then it would be impossible for you to infer or affirm a better or true belief. So here's the deal. If our thoughts and beliefs are forced upon us and we could not have chosen better thoughts and beliefs, then mm -hmm. we're simply left assuming that our determined thoughts and beliefs are good, let alone that our beliefs are true. So if that's the case, then we could never rationally affirm that our beliefs really are the inference to the best explanation. We could only assume it, and that assumption would not be up to you either. It would be up to something or someone else that causally determines you to make that assumption. Um, so here's the significant this sounds a little bit like planting his argument, like, um, uh, from his book, uh, where the, uh, which the book am I thinking of? Yeah. Where, where the, the conflict, conflict really lies. Yeah. Where the conflict really lies. I mean, it, it's pretty devastating, uh, when you think about it's, some it's, of these premises as you bring it out. Right. It's very similar. Uh, I do a uh, quote from Plantinga in my book, and I talk about his evolutionary argument against naturalism. But then, you know, the thing is, I think uh, the free thinking argument against naturalism is a little stronger um, because on the evolutionary argument against naturalism, what Plantinga does is he shows, well, look, on if, if naturalism and evolution is true, then human beliefs aren't aimed at truth. They're aimed at survival. Mm -hmm. And that's much different than truth. So now we don't have uh, we, we lose um, we, we have a defeater against our beliefs, if that's true. Well, look, uh, you know, some have argued, though, and they'll say, well, look, uh, if my if my beliefs are aimed at survival uh, is you'll probably survive better if your beliefs are true. Therefore, um, we have reason to think our beliefs are probably true. But I'll, I'll say, look, on the free thinking argument against naturalism, it shows that your thoughts and beliefs are ultimately caused and determined by physics and chemistry, fizzing and popping. Yeah. That's not aimed at anything, right? So you don't have, uh, your, your beliefs aren't aimed at truth. They're not even aimed at survival. Yeah. It's just, they're, they're just random. They're not aimed at anything <laughs> if physics and chemistry is running the show. Yeah. Now, I show that, the goal, and there is no real goal. So that's right. That's right. Um, and, and so that gets us then into the fine tuning argument in the last uh, chapter. And I show how we do need some teleology and a goal here and, and that God has to create us uh, with uh, cognitive faculties and the ability to reason and what that entails and, and things like that. So now, I, now the problem is there for the Calvinist as well, or for the exhaustive divine determinist, because on, on an ed view, um, even though... I'm shifting gears here because I'm going against the, the free thinking argument against naturalism. But side note, if God is the one that causes and determines every belief, every thought and belief of every human all the time, then our thoughts and beliefs aren't aimed at truth either. They're aimed at God's will. And apparently God wants most humans to hold false theological beliefs. In fact, I think everybody holds a, probably uh, at least one false theological belief and Calvinists can't even agree on everything. And so mm -hmm. now if God's will is for every human to hold false theological beliefs, at least some, now we don't have uh, 
justification or, or a reason to think that our theological beliefs, including that God exhaustively causally determines everything, is true. So anyway, I'll get back to the problem of uh, naturalism here. Um, uh, I would say this: the significant problem for the 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 determinist uh, right here. I'm going to pick on the atheistic naturalist. It logically follows that if naturalism is true, then atheists or any anybody else for that matter cannot possess justification for their beliefs, which most epistemologists would say is required for knowledge. Um, and one can happen to have true beliefs. However, if they do not claim justification for a specific belief, then if justification is required for knowledge, then their belief does not qualify as a knowledge claim. And so mm -hmm. with this in mind, if one cannot freely infer the best explanation, then one has no justification that their belief really is the best explanation. So without justification for a belief, a reason to think it's true, then any claim of reason-based knowledge regarding the said belief, it just goes down the drain or out the window or whatever. So all, all we're left with at that point is question-begging assumptions. Again, that assumption would be caused and determined by something else other than you. But question-begging assumptions are logical fallacies and thus are not reasons. That's not justification. It's not a reason to think anything is true. So here's the deal. Humans possess the ability to rationally infer knowledge claims. That's obvious. And to argue against that would affirm it because one would have to offer claims of knowledge to the contrary. <laughs> and on top of that, think about this. If one rejects the ability to rationally affirm knowledge claims, then why should anybody listen to them? You know, they're exactly. saying, I don't know anything. Anyway, let me give you a, a short, quick thought experiment that I use to help. Uh, you know, I, I gave you a lot of philosophy there. I think this kind of makes it easy to understand. So this is what I call my mad scientist thought experiment. There's lots of mad scientist thought experiments out there. This one's mine. So suppose somehow, Bobby, that a mad scientist got control of your brain and everything that you think. Um, so now he causally determines you. Uh, he causally determines all of your thoughts and beliefs all the time. So this now includes exactly what you think of and about and exactly how you think of and about it. So all of your thoughts and beliefs and, and all of your beliefs about your thoughts and all your thoughts about your beliefs they're all caused and determined by the mad scientist. And this also includes the next words that are going to come out of your mouth and even the next words that are going through your head, right? All of those words are caused and determined by the mad scientist. So question, Bobby, how can you, <laughs> how can it. you, Bobby Conway, not the mad scientist, rationally affirm the current beliefs in your head is good, bad, better, the best, true or probably true, you know, note the range of options from which to choose. How can you choose one of those without begging the question? If the mad scientist is going to causally determine the next words out of your mouth, go. Yeah. I'm hosed, bro. Yeah. You're hosed. I, right? I, I, I'm hosed. Yeah, I do. I think that's a, I've heard you use uh, this before and I've read, uh, read it before. And I think it's, uh, I think it's compelling. I really do. I think it's a, it's you, you put people in a bind right there and you have to chew on that for a little bit and think about that. And I think that that really goes to back up as a thought experiment, the case that you're already building with your philosophical argument. And, and so I just say this, you replace that ma mad scientist with physics and chemistry, or you replace yeah. the mad scientist with God or anything else. And you got the exact same rationality problems, but for different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, Tim. Okay, so as as we've talked through a lot of the philosophical backing as it relates to Molinism, uh, you know, your claim is that this can split, uh, you know, the horns of the dilemma uh, as a viewpoint to pick up. You used to be a Calvinist, now you're a Molinist, president and founder of Free Thinking Ministries. You did your PhD in systematic theology on this work. Your book's out now, number one on Amazon and philosophy of religion. Encourage people to go and get it. Uh, let's deal with some of the biblical data. Uh, okay. Can you give us an argument for uh, libertarian freedom based on the biblical data? Yeah. Uh, here's my syllogism. It's just a three-step syllogism now. Two premises, one conclusion. Uh, premise one. 
If Christians possess the ability to choose among a range of options, each consistent and compatible with their natures, then they possess libertarian freedom. Premise two, Christians possess the ability to choose between giving in to temptation or to take the way of escape God promises to provide in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Therefore, Christians possess libertarian freedom. So, excuse me, uh, the first premise uh, simply defines what is meant by libertarian freedom, and that's the only premise in which the, the determined determinist is left to attack is the second. However, this puts the divine determinist in an awkward and an, an uncomfortable position if he is also claiming to be a Bible-believing Christian, because the Christian who rejects premise two then opposes a plain and common sense interpretation of the Apostle Paul's words. And since God then is, seems to have provided at least some people, uh, Christians here, is, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians, his uh, target audience was Christian. So I'm not saying this applies to everybody. I'm just saying, hey, at least Paul's audience, these Christians here, have an ability not to sin. Uh, mm -hmm. So Christians, therefore, are able not to fall into temptation. But Christians still sin, right? So it logically mm -hmm. follows that whenever a Christian does commit a sin, he didn't have to. He didn't have to miss the mark because there was a genuine ability for him to do otherwise. Paul sure. calls it a way of escape, and this is exactly mm -hmm. what is meant by libertarian freedom. You could sin or not sin. And so, I mean, Paul's clear. God promises to provide this way of escape. So at least Christians, when we do still sin, we could have done otherwise. The Christian possesses the ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options, uh, in this case, to sin or not to sin. Both of these options are consistent and compatible with our regenerated nature, right? So uh, it follows that when a Christian freely chooses to sin, he was able not to sin. Uh, it follows then that he's genuinely responsible for his sin and he's got libertarian freedom. And so I say, don't say the devil made me do it. And whatever you do, don't <laughs> say God made me do it. You're responsible. God gave you a way out, a way of escape, and you failed to take it. Therefore, you're responsible and you need to repent. But since premise one is true by definition and premise two is supported by the inspired word of God, Christians have good reason. We've got biblical reason to affirm limited libertarian freedom. That just means libertarian freedom in some things some of the time. It doesn't mean I've got libertarian freedom all the time. It just means that on occasion I've got it. And, and that, so that is to say that the Bible is clear that at least some people possess the ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options that are each consistent and compatible with our image of God natures. Um, mm. our, our natures are still given to us by God. They're determined by God. I just argue that God has given us a nature like his that can sometimes choose between or among a range of options, each compatible with our nature. So to say it another way, I'll just say it like this. By God's grace, Christians can freely choose to sin or take the way of escape promised by God. Therefore, Christians possess libertarian free will. And I give some other uh, scriptures in there too uh, to make different cases, um, but I like to start with that one. Yeah, I think 1 Corinthians 10, 13, uh, that's a great verse. First verse I ever memorized as a Christian. And, uh, you know, again, we have the freedom to do otherwise. But what's great being Christians is we also have a resource in God where, you know, he's not coercing us, but he's there to come and help us when we look to him. And that's a comfort to me. So you've given a biblical piece of data, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, to kind of, you know, reinforce libertarian freedom. Uh, maybe as uh, we wrap up, give one uh, one example of God uh, in his middle knowledge uh, from maybe the Old Testament or the New Testament for our listeners. Oh, let's see. Well, um, so let's think of, I've got, I've got so many I want to, uh, <laughs> um, I, I would say when uh, David and uh, David prays, or is, David's asking God, "What would happen if I stick around?" And yes. God says, uh, "If you stick around, 
you're hosed. <laughs> so David gets the heck out of Dodge and it doesn't happen. Right. So, yes. but, so it didn't happen, but God gave David uh, some, uh, he told him what would happen if he did it. And now that's not middle knowledge. That's counterfactual knowledge. So middle yeah. knowledge uh, takes place um, logically prior to God's creative decree. So there's multiple places in scripture where God, where it's clear that God has counterfactual knowledge. So then the question is, does a maximally great being possess counterfactual knowledge logically prior to his creative decree? And uh, yeah, if God is necessarily omniscient, um, then I argue yeah. that of course he would. And I, and I do have uh, arguments in the book uh, based on maximal greatness and stuff that would uh, uh, make that case as well. So, uh, Tim, thank you so much. I want to uh, bring Tim Holland, our executive producer. Uh, we went a little bit longer because we got off to a late start, uh, but uh, I didn't know if there was a question or two that we wanted to present to Tim uh, with our time or if we just need to uh, land uh, the plane. We didn't agree on our end time today, uh, but uh, I do want to say uh, thank you, Tim Stratton, for laying out this argument. Uh, we walked through it and it's the kind of thing that people can go and listen to. Uh, we will take this argument, uh, Tim, and the different questions that uh, we asked you and we'll put them in smaller clips. So we'll make more videos of this. Uh, cool. We'll also put it on a podcast at One Minute Apologist whereby people who don't have time to watch can listen to it. Um, but I do think it takes time to learn theology and um, this is an argument here that you were developing. And so it's a little bit, if you're a listener of One Minute Apologists each week, uh, you know, it's a little bit more organic typically, but we really wanted you to hear the structure in the way that Tim laid this out. And so that's why we were a little bit more careful. So Tim Hull, any words for us, bro? Sure. Yeah, there's uh, uh, lots of questions. Tim Stratton, fantastic job. Man, my head is spinning with a bunch of questions, but I won't monopolize this question and answer time with my questions. I will uh, answer or ask a few of them from the chat. I thought one that was really good came in from Vince, and Vince asked, uh, if Judas was placed in a different circumstance, would he have sinned against Jesus, or was it preordained for the scriptures according to Molinism? Well, God would know if Judas would have chosen differently or not. I don't know. Um, but it was preordained and predestined in the sense that God knew that if he created this world, that Judas would betray Jesus. And so then when he created the world, he knew that Judas would freely betray Ju Jesus. So, um, so yeah, I mean, Molinism is... Uh, huge when it comes to predestination. We affirm it. Look, I say I, I affirm exhaustive divine predestination. I reject exhaustive divine determinism. And the problem is so many people conflate improperly predestination with causal determinism. And in my book, I have an argument that deductively concludes Therefore, predestination and causal determinism ought not be conflated. So you'll have to get the book and read that syllogism. I just gave you the, the conclusion. Um, but they are not the same thing. But I affirm predestination across the board. No, that, 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 and that's awesome. I was having this almost exact conversation uh, with somebody on the worship team a few weeks ago at church. And it was great to kind of just the, the pastor buyers would sit down and they're what are you guys talking about? And we try to sum it up and then we get back into the conversation. So I'm excited to forward your conversation tonight with Bobby uh, to him and, and we'll cool. continue on that dialogue. So uh, a few more quick questions here. Uh, Jonathan asks, um, he said, thank you for this. In which ways do you differ with Dr. Craig's view on Molinism? So where, where, where do you and Dr. Craig find some differences on your view of Molinism, if any? Um, I'm not... I'm not aware of any uh, real differences. Uh, we disagree on very few things. Uh, in fact, I've I wrote an article kind of joking about how Dr. Craig and I agree on so many things. Uh, <laughs> about the only thing that we have found that we really disagree uh, um, is is on. Okay, we both agree that the B theory of time is false, but we disagree on what would follow 
if the B theory of time were true. Um, and I think that's about all we can uh, find to disagree on right now, of any consequence. So um, yeah, as regarding Molinism, I'd have to think about that. I, I really would have to say I stood on his shoulders for so much of this and also Kirk McGregor and uh, uh, John David Lang, uh, Kenneth Keithley. I mean, these are some other uh, brilliant Molinists that have gone on in front of me. And I'm also just surrounded by a great cloud of uh, witnesses who are all Molinists also, so many good friends. Uh, we have many conversations, sometimes heated debates. We don't always disagree on everything or we don't always agree on everything. And, uh, and we, you know, it's just really an iron sharpening iron, but iron, but uh, all these people and including really Dr. Craig, I mean, Dr. Craig said it on the back of the book. He said uh, he's always hoped to see somebody take his work, uh, make it their own, expand upon it and run with it. And, and he says that that's what I've done here. And so I really stood on the shoulders of giants and he was probably the biggest giant of them all. And at least off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that we would really disagree on uh, regarding Molinism, but I'm sure we can no. find something. Yeah, right. Well, and, and we can always find places to disagree. Yeah. So I'll, I'll end with this question. I know that there's other questions, but uh, I'm hoping this one uh, really tees you up to, uh, you know, to, to put, pitch your book here. We've talked about it a number of times. We talked about some different arguments in there. But uh, Andrew Green asks, uh, does Tim Stratton, does Stratton's book give a working understanding of Calvinism and Arminianism? Who is this book for, and does one need to have a working knowledge of those models, or is this kind of introductory? So, who's this book for? Let's just let's just start well, there and, and kind of go from there. Uh, the book is for. Let me uh, let me read to you the first part of. Uh, so Kirk McGregor writes the uh, the foreword, and uh, there it is. So he says, Doctor Tim Stratton has the rare and precious gift of taking highly complex issues in philosophical theology and making them easily understandable to lay people at the same time as he shows their tremendous importance for scholars in the disciplines of philosophy and religion. This book will be profitably and enjoyably read by lay people and scholars interested in various themes, including biblical exegesis, the history of Christian thought, metaphysics, epistemology, systematic theology, and practical Christian living. So uh, Kirk's Forward is awesome. I, I recommend people buy the book just to read Kirk's Forward. Um, but uh, I, I think the book is for, I mean, it was it's based on my PhD dissertation. Now, I wrote this dissertation at a reformed university. Um, so I was at Northwest University, uh, Reformed Theology Department, and sta staunch Reformed. So I, it was like pulling teeth just to get my research proposal accepted. I almost gave up. I spent close to, it seemed like a year, trying to get the research proposal accepted. And I, at one point I thought, I either have to go a different route and choose a different topic because they did not want me to argue for libertarian freedom or Molinism. Um, I either have to take a different route or quit and go somewhere else. Um, finally, one professor said, because I, I was saying, I think I can show how Molinism and Calvinism and, 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 uh, and even Reformed theology are all compatible. And he said, Sh you know, win me over. And I finally, uh, I guess, did the job, won him over. And he said, okay, I'll be your supervisor. And, uh, but then I had, I was worried, man, as, as we were getting closer to the, to the dissertation going to the committee, I was like, man, I don't know if I'm going to pass. I, I mean, Bobby, I remember talking to you about this in Israel. I was really worried because I just did not know if a reformed theology department was going to pass me. But one of the guys on the committee uh, said that it was the best, or at least one of the best dissertations he's ever graded. Um, so I wrote this at an academic level, but at the same time, I have a passion as a former youth pastor to try to bring things down to the streets, right? I like to take things from the, the ivory towers of academia and bring them down to the streets for everybody to enjoy. So I tried hard and Kirk McGregor seems to think that I did that. So I think if you if you're out there and you take theology seriously, even if you're a lay person, even if you've uh, never studied deep theology, uh, but you want to take your theology seriously, I think 
I think you can handle this. Well, no, that's great. And again, I really appreciate um, all of the insight that you gave tonight. Uh, it's available on Kindle as well. I did see that today yep. that you posted that it's on Kindle for $10. Yep. So um, right. man, there's a good chance that I'll pick that up on Kindle and have Siri read it to me because I like to, to listen to books. I know Bobby likes to listen to books as well. Mm-hmm, yeah. So Bobby, any final thoughts, man? I know that there's lots of chat. We had a, a, a planting as bulldog is in the chat asking some great questions. Shannon had another great question, but uh, man, if we keep going on with questions. Apologetic Squared had some good questions as well. Um, sorry, I just don't think we're going to be able to get to all these questions. We've, we've gone almost an hour and 40 minutes here, and, uh, and we probably should wrap it up before uh, you know somebody falls asleep on us or, or whatnot. So, Bobby, any final <laughs> closing thoughts you want to, to wrap us up with? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say on one side, it'd be good when we have a lot of questions and we can't address just so we can extract them, and then we can always have Tim on for a future Q&A sure. uh, follow-up. I would say uh, if you're looking for a great stocking stuffer for your kindergartner or preschool kids, be sure to get Tim's book. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's got a pretty cover. I mean, the colors are good. It does. does. Yeah. Tim, I want to see by the end of the week um, a preschooler on, on, on the playground reading a copy of your book. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I'll, 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 challenge accepted. I, I have a kindergartner. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get her to put a book in her hand and Photoshop right. it in for you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, but in all seriousness, I would say um, th- this is a, this is a, a piece I would encourage you to get uh, maybe go through it as a small group. If you got a group of people that want to think about things intellectually, uh, you know, go through it as a group, each get a copy of this, take your time. Uh, you know, Tim's been working on this for years, so don't feel discouraged if you listen today and you're thinking, what, what did we just talk about? Um, uh, Tim said at the outset, it, it can be a little bit uh, heady as you're getting into it, but it really does um, elucidate, clarify, crystallize, uh, in my opinion, a lot of the questions that can hang you up maybe as a Calvinist or an Arminian. And I'm just so thankful for this third option. And I thank you, Tim, for your ministry. And I love you, brother. And I wish you all the best. Well, thanks, guys. Love you guys, too. And uh, thanks for having me on the show. I had a great time. And and I guess, Bobby, now you'll be the, the one hour and 40 minute apologist. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, it can happen, baby. We can, we can go long. We can go long. We, we, we've got it happening. Yeah. Till next time, Stratton. All right. Peace out.